Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, what's up? Another video, let's do it. Uh, this one's a bit long, and it's only one of three, wow. The next one's 31 too, what's the next one? 21, 31, 21, 50, 31, 35, 52, 85, which would be 53, 25, plus that, that's 90, 93, 25, 94, 70, which would be 95, 10. It's over an hour and a half long. I didn't have to do it down to the minute, but I did. Or the second, I guess. All right, let's do it. Okay, that's one of three. So this is very long, and I think I might have to separate it even further. But maybe I won't. Who knows? Let's do it. Let's get right into it. Battle of Midway, 1942. Told from the Japanese perspective, one of three. Very good series, great channel, Matamayor, and you guys seem to have been very much liking it too, so I'm happy, very happy to continue this reaction. Let's do it. The Battle of Midway, 1942, told from the Japanese perspective. I just said that. If you're new to the channel, hello. I know I look like a mess, but I guess I always do. Uh, my name's Connor. I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. The original link to this video will be at the top of the description below. Like always, I'd recommend watching the previous videos. That's up to you. Discord link will be right below that. Uh, so you'll see it right at the... Uh, without even pressing show more in the description, you can just click on it. And if you already have Discord uh, downloaded, which most people do, I think, nowadays, it'll bring you right there. Love to have, have you. More the merrier. <clears throat> Let's do it. Hope you all are doing well. Let's go. From the Japanese perspective, I like that. Okay. I have a tremendous amount of respect for the uh, country of Japan. And the more I learn about their history, the more respect I gain. They have some very horrible parts uh, during World War II. Extremely horrible, but every country has terrible parts. And you can't just not admire the great parts of a country if any terrible part is um, going to just outweigh that. And uh, that's not fair. Let's do it. Obviously, no one's alive today who, who had anything to do with that stuff. Or maybe they're... No. No, what am I talking about? No way. All right, let's get into it. It's been six months since the attack on Pearl Harbor, and so far, the war has been triumphant for the Empire of Japan. They had achieved a string of victories across the Pacific and had captured many research-rich territories. However, Japan still found herself in a difficult position. Despite all of their successes, their biggest opponent, the United States, had yet to show any signs of surrendering. I'm almost rooting for Japan. I'm, I'm, you can't root for people in history. You know the outcome. Sometimes I, I root for people on, on certain sides where I don't really know the outcome or much about it. But um, I just admire Japan a lot. I just, I really do. This was worrisome. Japan needed to end the war quickly before the U.S., with its mighty industrial strength, ultimately defeated them. So what Japan needed was to win a decisive battle, one that would demoralize the Americans and finally bring them to the negotiating table. I forgot. If you're not ready to learn, there's the door. Just get the hell out of here, all right? You're in the wrong class. Get out. Go to home ec or gym or whatever. Let's do it. That would demoralize the Americans and finally bring them to the negotiating table. It was considered that America's center of gravity was its Pacific fleet, primarily its carriers. Destroy this, and you destroy their will to continue the war. They Therefore, there. the only chance Japan had of winning this war was if the American carrier fleet was destroyed. But the question was, how to provoke the carriers from leaving its safe base? I just failed to drink that, fell out of my mouth. But are, were they, were aircraft carriers at this point? Someone might have answered this for me. I think I might have asked this before. But were they the main targets of the Japanese I almost was under the belief that the reputation of the aircraft carrier was built kind of during this, the World War, World War II, and that at the time of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, 
I, I guess her reputation was already solidified, and it was really, really lucky that the uh, aircraft carriers were not in port at the time. But uh, yeah, I didn't know that was their main target. They but I the question battleships was, still how to supreme. provoke the carriers from leaving its safe base at Pearl Harbor? The answer, attack an objective the Americans wouldn't relinquish without a fight. And after much debate, it was decided that Midway would be that objective. If the Japanese attacked and invaded Midway, the Americans would certainly respond in force and this would finally give the Imperial Japanese Navy a chance to annihilate the American carrier fleet once and for all. And thus, Operation MI was created with the objective of capturing Midway and destroying the Pacific Fleet. The Japanese premised their plan on achieving surprise, and therefore would have to make the 3,000 mile voyage on radio silence. I like how they went up to also, Alaska. Also, they were to disperse their forces in order to avoid detection and mask their intentions. Right. Going up to Alaska to kind of do a little juke, like make them think that you might be going to attack uh, American soil. In conjunction, or not American soil, just uh, you know, a different spot. Obviously. There was another I'll operation to the north to take over the Aleutian Islands, which was codenamed Operation AL. And so, on the early hours of June 4th, all the forces were in position to attack a small, tiny atoll in the Central Pacific. The stage was set for one of the most epic engagements in naval history. This is the Battle of Midway. The battle will be told from the Japanese perspective. The fog of war will be included during this video. Okay. That means you, the audience member, will only know the positions of the Americans the moment the Japanese commander knew of it. Okay, that's cool. This is to put the audience member in the commander's seat to see how they would have reacted themselves given the unique circumstances and complex scenarios that plagued the I Japanese like on it. the morning of June 4th. Very, all right, very so well. So to start off, let's see who the commander was and what his forces were. Spearheading the MI formations were four top-of-the-line fleet carriers of the first mobile striking force also known as the Kido Butai. This was the most destructive offensive weapon the Japanese Navy had, and would be the main protagonist of the upcoming fight. Its commander is Vice Admiral Nagumo Chuichi. He was 55 and had assumed command of the first air fleet in April of 1941. He didn't get this post because he had naval aviation experience. In fact, he has specialized in torpedoes. He got the job simply based on seniority. It was said his command style lacked decisiveness and that he was too reliant on his staff. Nevertheless, in June of 1942, he was the most experienced carrier commander in the world. Nagumo had four carriers with him this day. His flagship was the Akagi. The Akagi was- I just want to give you guys a heads up. I'm, I, I promise I'll stop pausing so much, but I want to make sure this is a good experience for you guys, but I will not. And you guys have been so great. Tell me, don't worry, rewind when you have to, but I just want to stress it. I will. I cannot just go through the video and miss something, and then just not. I, I ha, if I miss something, I don't understand something. I will go back. I will not hesitate. And so, just I'm giving you a heads up. Was the oldest and longest of all the flat tops. She had a large aircraft capacity, and since she had been converted from a battle cruiser hull, possessed a high speed. The Kaga was a battleship conversion, so this made her the least maneuverable and the slowest of the four. But she did embark the most aircraft. While so typical squadron strength built. was 18, she herself carried 27 carrier attack planes. As carriers from the start. These two carriers were the stolid warhorses of the Kido Butai. They packed a mean punch and were not to be messed around with. Next came the two dashing cavaliers of Carrier Division 2. They were the smaller but more nimble Soryu class. They were designed from the kill up, had a good air group size and a very high speed due to their light hulls and construction. However, the downside was that they were lightly armored. The Soryu came first, being commissioned in 1937. She was well liked in the Navy. Her near sister ship, the Hiru, was almost identical, but had a larger bridge and was slightly better armored. Ryo Admiral Yamaguchi was the commander of Carrier Division 2, and he made the Hiru his flagship. He was another high-ranking member of the fleet okay. and was known to be an aggressive, hot-tempered commander compared to Nagumo. From the four carriers, Nagumo had a combined strength of 248 aircraft. 260 total aircraft if one includes the scout planes from his escorting cruisers. What was equally important in the aircraft themselves was the quality of Nagumo's air crews. It wasn't a stretch to say that at this point in the war, the best naval pilots in the world 
who are on board these four ships. After watching the, uh, the Port Arthur stuff, uh, the Sino-Japanese War, and the way, albeit, you know, the distance that the Russians had to travel still, um, they were extremely capable and just annihilated the Russian fleet when it was uh, getting close to um, Korea or Japan, China, you know, northern China. And so they are absolutely very capable. And that was, um, you know, four decades ago prior to this. At this point in the war, the best naval pilots in the world were on board these four ships. Nagumo's mission was not going to be a walk in the park. He essentially had a dual mission. One, take out Midway. He needed to neutralize the base and its aircraft before the invasion convoy arrived two days later. And task number two was to keep a lookout for enemy carriers that might appear in the defense of the islands. Now this was unlikely as the Americans were not expected to react so quickly to the invasion. But as a safe measure, he was to keep half of his strike force armed with anti-shipping weapons in the event the Americans did show up early. Okay. It has to be mentioned here that there were some ominous signs for the Japanese. As mentioned, the Japanese were counting on surprise for this bold operation to succeed. However, on the eve of battle, there were signs that this may not be going their way. Intelligence had revealed suspicious enemy activities around Midway, meaning the Americans were more alert than they should have been. I don't know much about the Battle of Midway, but I, I do, if I remember correctly, I believe America did, you know, know what was, was going on before the, uh, I, I could be wrong, but I think they, they knew ahead of time. And second, it must be emphasized that the Japanese, up to this point, have failed to confirm the location of the carriers. The Japanese believed they would have to face against two, possibly three carriers to their four, so it was imperative that they get a confirmation of their whereabouts. It was believed that they would still be in Pearl Harbor during the first days of the operation, and there were two attempts to verify this. The first was a reconnaissance mission to reconnoiter Pearl Harbor. However, this mission had been canceled but there was still a fallback plan. A picket line of submarines ahead of Nagumo's force. And so far, none of them had reported anything at all. This indicated to Nagumo that the American carriers were most likely still in port. So as far as Nagumo was concerned, everything was going as planned. Dawn, June 4th. Compared to the scattered cloud cover to the northeast, the Kido Butai found itself under low but light cumulus clouds. The carriers continued to steam into the wind, which was coming from the southeast, to prepare for the air raid. At 0430, a strike of 108 aircraft was launched against Midway. All of these planes were launched in just 10 minutes, a testament to the skill and training of the Japanese pilots. Leading the strike was Lieutenant Tomonaga Joishi. He was a veteran of the air war over China, but this would be his first combat sortie against the Americans. Nagumo had to keep the other half of his planes in reserve in case American carriers appeared. The pilots in this group were the A-team, the best the Kido Butai had to offer. Akagi's torpedo squadron was said to be the best in the Navy, while Carrier Division 2 had the reputation of having the best dive bombers. Any report of an American carrier and these pilots would make easy work of them. At the same time of the launch of the Midway Strike Group, reconnaissance planes were sent out from the escorting cruisers. The search consisted of seven lines, six of which stretched out to 300 miles. Something I didn't say before that I, I should have, uh, I was, when he said that, when he sent out the, um, he stopped the, uh, the uh, reconnaissance by airplane going towards uh, Hawaii and then sent out the submarines who didn't report anything and then that led him to believe that they were most likely in port. And I'm saying this mainly because this guy, Amatomayor, said to kind of make your own judgments and things. I, I just wonder, I mean, that means that they aren't coming towards you, but couldn't they be to your north or south or southwest or, or whatnot, or southeast? Clearly, with only seven planes to cover more than a hundred out the escorting cruisers, the search consisted of seven lines, six of which stretched out to 300 miles. Clearly, with only seven planes to cover more than 176,000 square miles, the search effort can be considered half-hearted, perhaps even negligent. 
but in Nagumo's defense, it must be reminded that this was a precautionary air search. Simply put, Nagumo and his staff were convinced that no enemy carriers would appear this early into the battle. Although, I would say criticism is justified. I mean, given the fact that Intel reported suspicious activities around Midway, and given the bad weather in the area, Nagumo should have doubled his search efforts as a safety measure. It's what a prudent commander would have done. Anyway, the launch of the search planes went well, except that the launching of float plane number 4 from the cruiser Tone was delayed for 30 minutes. Thanks you guys, by the way, clarifying in a past video the difference between a float plane and a, a boat plane and you know a regular plane where the boat plane, its hull can land and take off you know, sitting on the water like a boat or the float plane plane has these kind of, I'm not sure if they were inflatable pontoons. The only thing is, I wonder how those float planes landed. Maybe they landed like a, uh, a boat plane would, but just without the pon the um, inflatable things on the sides, they would sink maybe, but not that important. Just wanted to point it out. As the military proverb goes, no plan survives contact with the enemy and today would be no exception. The operation officially began to unravel at 0532. An American Catalina PBY was spotted surveying the Kido Butai. Damn, Nagumo had been spotted, meaning surprise had been lost. This meant that the Americans would be able to get their land-based aircraft airborne before his strike arrived. So they spotted them in between sending him out. Okay. Or they spotted him after he had sent them out. Gotcha. As predicted, the Americans had been able to launch all of its planes before the strike arrived. The bombers went to attack the Japanese carriers. Only the fighters stayed behind to defend the islands. These were 18 obsolete buffaloes and 6 wildcats. So if the, battle, if the aircraft carriers were spotted by the, by the Americans, assuming that the Americans could see the decks of the aircraft carriers and, and see if the planes had left already. I'm just wondering if the U.S. was sure that when they spotted the carriers that the, att that the attack planes had already been sent or if it was kind of, they weren't exactly sure. They intercepted the Japanese at 0620, 30 miles from the base. They never stood a chance with the more agile Zeros. In the ensuing battle, 13 Buffaloes and two Wildcats were lost. The carrier strike aircraft pushed through and began their bomb runs. Carrier Division 2 level bombers struck first at 0634. The dive bombers would come next at 0640. On Easter Island, the power plant, command posts, gasoline lines, and mess hall were destroyed. But damage to the runways was minor. Not the mess hall. On Sand Island, the oil tanks were set ablaze and the water lines were hit. A seaplane hangar and various base facilities were also destroyed. For their effort, American fighters and anti-aircraft fire destroyed 11 Japanese planes. Another 14 would be rendered unserviceable when they landed back on their carriers. That's a 23% loss. The damage to Midway support facilities had been heavy, but the base wasn't out of the fight. The air group commander, Lt. Tomonaga, looked back at the condition of Midway and with great dissatisfaction had to report back to Nagumo that a second strike was needed to neutralize the base. What follows next is a series of complicated events and situations happening to both the Kido Butai and on board Nagumo's headquarters. So I'll tackle them separately, starting with the initial airstrikes against the Kido Butai. At 0710, six TBF Avengers and four Army B-26s were spotted approaching the Japanese carriers. This would be the first of four separate attacks from Midway base aircraft that would harass them throughout the early morning. Over 30 fighters were sent to destroy the 10 American warplanes. The Avengers selected the Hiru. Zero swarmed over them and one by one the torpedo bombers were shot down. 
only two were able to launch at the Hiru, but from extreme range, and they missed. The four B-26s, which had been modified to carry torpedoes, went for the Akagi. Only two were able to launch, but they both missed. The real it's danger was posed by the hearing. last B-26. The damaged bomber made no attempt to pull out of its attack. Instead, it headed directly for Akagi's bridge. Nagumo and his staff saw this and were shocked. The Americans were not supposed to show this kind of bravery. The bomber pressed on it was by the last B-26. The real danger was posed by the last B-26. The damaged bomber made no attempt to pull out of its attack. Instead, it headed directly for Akagi's bridge. Nagumo and his staff saw this and were shocked. The Americans were not supposed to show this kind of bravery. The bomber pressed on and at last minute, narrowly missed the bridge and crashed into the sea. His suicide attack had failed, but surely it had given Nagumo and his staff one hell of a scare. Despite the bravery and determination, the attack had failed to achieve a single hit. Five Avengers and two Marauders had been shot down. The Japanese lost two zeros. Half an hour later, at 0753, a new force was spotted approaching the mobile force. 16 Marine Corps Dauntless Dive Bombers. Nine zeros set out to destroy them. The dive bombers pressed on and went for the Hiru. Instead of going for a steep dive, ensuring accuracy, these planes conducted a glide bombing attack. They were clearly inexperienced pilots if this was their way of attacking. They managed to bracket the Hiru with some near misses, but ultimately no hits were scored. They lost half of their squadron, leaving only 8 survivors to return to Midway. The Japanese lost only 1-0. And shortly after that attack, 15 Army B-17s attacked from 20,000 feet. At this altitude, the B-17s were immune to the anti-aircraft fire below them. However, this also greatly diminished their accuracy. They went after the Soru, Hiru, and Akagi, but the carriers below them had more than enough time to conduct evasive maneuvers and avoid the bombs. There were no losses on either sides and no hits were scored. Only near misses on the Soru and Hiru caused any alarm. A remarkable set of photographs were taken at this moment. Here's the Hiru dodging a wow. couple of very near misses. Blows my mind. Note how, the three fighters of combat air patrol on their flight deck. How these things can maneuver. Here and, uh, we got the Akari, Nagumo's flagship, while under attack. Easily noticeable is the red rising sun painted on the deck. And the third picture shows the Soru. She's conducting a tight turn to starboard to avoid being hit. Carrier doctrine and flight deck operations need to be commented on here. During attacks, the main priority was obviously the defense of the carriers. This came in three forms. Anti-aircraft fire, combat air patrol, and evasive maneuvers. Japanese anti-aircraft fire capabilities were very weak, so could not be counted on. Their evasive maneuvers were not. So this left weak. fighter cover and evasive maneuvers as the main forms of defense for Nagumo's force. There was a downside though. One, due to the evasive maneuvers that require wild and violent turns, it was obviously dangerous to spot or launch a squadron of aircraft while being bombed. So I would love to see a ship as large as one of these things just moving as and turning as fast as it can. That'd be, that'd be a crazy let's sight. Say to spot or launch a squadron of aircraft while being bombed. So let's say you wanted to launch an airstrike, but then you found yourself under attack. It would actually be better to wait until the attack was over to then fly off for strike. And second point, as these pictures show, Japanese flight decks had to be kept clear anyways during air attacks for the replenishment of their own fighters. And this was rather frequent since the Zero had about 7 seconds of cannon ammunition. Fighters were given priority because they did after all provide the most effective measure of defense. Hence, the only activity you would see during attacks was the recovery, replenishment, and relaunching of these small packets of fighters. Three at a time, sometimes six at a time. In other words, and the point I'm trying to drive in here was that, as a general rule, you couldn't launch a strike while under attack. So let's just say hypothetically that at this moment Nagumo wanted to send a strike. It was you prudent to, to just wait until the attack was over, maybe 15-20 minutes, 
and then launches aircraft. So maybe these attacks aren't being accurate or deadly, but they are hindering flight operations. Keep this in mind as you will see the fateful consequences of it. Okay. Midway's final attack came at 0827. 11 old Marine Corps Vindicator dive bombers arrived from the southeast. These were obsolete bombers and they wisely decided not to go for the formidably defended carriers. Instead, they selected the battleship Haruna as their target. There were 11 fighters on combat air patrol to oppose them. The Americans persisted and made their dives on the Haruna, but once again, none of them scored a hit. Two Vindicators were lost during the attack. And in the midst of all of this, a submarine had been spotted, and at 0825, it fired a torpedo at the battleship Karishima. The battleship dodged. Just, I'm supposed to be putting myself in the shoes of the Japanese here, and so I want to be like, show a little bit of emotion and be like, nice that. But at the same time, I'm like, oh, that was an American pilot that just went down, and so I just have these like, mix emotions that just cancel each other out, and I feel like I'm just being like straight faced. And. I and in the midst of all of this, a submarine had been spotted, and at 0825, it fired a torpedo at the battleship Karishima. The battleship dodged it by turning to port, and the destroyer Arashi was detached and sent in pursuit to chase down the submarine. As you can see, this had all been a narrow escape for the Japanese. Very These good. series of close calls surely had everyone on the edge of their seats. Although the Japanese were impressed by the determination of the attacks, they were not impressed by the skills of these pilots. Right. Despite 52 planes being dedicated to the attack, not a single hit was achieved on the Japanese. The biggest success these attacks had was that it had kept the Japanese off balance from 0700 to 0830, which, as we will see, was a critical time for Nagumo. During the early morning attacks on the Kido Butai, a more serious situation was developing in the high command with Nagumo and his staff. Shortly after 0700 hours, Nagumo received Tomonaga's report that a second strike was needed. The news was unpleasant, but had actually been expected. How could a force of 72 bombers, half of which were armed with medium-sized bombs, be expected to neutralize a fortified base? He could allow Tomonaga's flight to return, refuel and rearm, and then send them back. But of course, this would take hours to complete, allowing the Americans to lick their wounds and reform their defense. This would contribute further casualties. He could allow Tomonaga's flight to return, refuel and rearm, and then send them back. But of course, this would take hours to complete, allowing the Americans to lick their wounds and reform their defense. This would contribute further casualties. Or alternatively, he could strike the Americans while they were still down. He could use his reserve aircraft who at the moment stood idly by doing nothing. But these were exclusively off the table because Yamamoto had ordered them to be reserved in case of an enemy carrier task force appearing. But surely, Yamamoto wasn't expecting Nagumo to fight an entire battle with only half his strength. I mean, come on, this was tantamount to making Nagumo fight this entire battle with one arm tied behind his back. Better than both arms tied behind your back. And this right here had been the fault in the whole midway plan. There simply weren't enough planes. There weren't enough planes to do the dual mission. To both attack midway and to keep a reserve in case enemy carriers appeared. So it's almost as if you're... By making sure both you can send out attack planes and have reserve planes for defense if another carrier comes in, an enemy carrier... It's almost as if you're ruining the whole plan by making sure you cover both areas. You either keep all your planes and put out a massive attack, attack when you see the carriers in range, or you put out all your planes to completely destroy their targets. And um, if you're caught uh, with your planes out defenseless, then you're defenseless. But maybe that's you have to commit one way or the other. So Nagumo looked at the maps, and by now his air searches were reaching their maximum range, and so far nothing had been found or reported. So why not use these planes for the second strike? And let's not forget that at this moment a Maverick plane from Midway had just tried to suicide crash into his bridge. 
Midway was clearly still a threat, and as long as his airbase was operational, it posed a danger to his carriers. This is what probably prompted Nagumo's consequent decision. Midway had to be neutralized. Thus, at 0715, Nagumo went against Yamamoto's orders and ordered the rearmament of his reserve aircraft. Seems like the right decision for me. The rearmament process began to in me. the hangars below. Torpedoes were removed and land bombs installed. The dive bombers weren't affected by this because they were armed once they had been spotted on the flight decks. So in reality, this chaotic, fast-paced rearming process was happening only in the hangars of the 1st Carrier Division. All in all, this process was going to take about an hour and a half to complete. Then, 30 minutes into the rearmament process, at 0745, Nagumo received a report. That Tone plane, the one that had been delayed, ran across an American force. Sight what appears to be 10 enemy surface units. Nagumo was stunned. He quickly canceled and reversed the rearmament order and took stock of the situation. It will base Great job, by the way, on the Mon I mean, Montemayor's great job on the fog of war kind of strategy, helping us get into the uh, mind of the Japanese. Uh, really cool. I don't see a lot of uh, videos do that. See the report. That Tone plane, the one that had been delayed, ran across an American force. Uh oh. Sight what appears to be 10 enemy surface units. I'm not American. I'm Japanese right now, all right? Japanese. Go get him. Stunned, he quickly canceled and reversed the rearmament order and took stock of the situation. It will basically boil down to two options for him. Send an immediate strike right now, or send a strike after Tomonaga's planes were recovered. This is what is most commonly known as Nagumo's Dilemma. Here's what I'm wondering. Maybe I'm completely wrong, but if you are going to take the latter option and um, send a strike after the uh, Tomonaga's force uh, recovers, obviously you have to keep your planes that you're arming right now, your reserve ones um, below deck um, while you land um, the force that's already out there. But that means, I wonder how quickly they can swap the above deck and below deck planes because the returning aircraft, many of them will have to be, many of them are going to be broken beyond repair, um, according to what he said previous and a little bit while ago in the video. Um, and some are going to be obviously need refueling and repair and changing of weapons, guns, and whatnot. Will it, will it take a lot of time to, to switch those? And so, will it, would it be easier to? send out your reserve before the other force lands so that you can have a clear below deck and above deck so but at the same time then you're only sending out half your force so i will ask the viewer to put themselves in nagumo's shoes for a while to better understand his conundrum i just did that and i'll let you know it's not as simple as it looks many factors have to be considered yeah the main one i'm thinking about is How do you get your reserve planes off the boat? You want to send them all out at one, at once in one massive attack, and so you'd like, because if you if you send out your reserve planes, they're going to be wasting fuel while you get the uh, returning planes ready, and so I feel like it would be a big problem. Although I don't know the the logistics and mechanics of this of this aircraft carrier and how they would swap the planes ready to go and the planes that just came back. And so that to me is sticking in my mind, but maybe that's no issue at all and they have a way around that. But yeah, how do you get all your planes out at once? Keep in mind that you would have had only 15 minutes to decide on the correct course of action. I got it. So let's first dive into the aggressive option, which is attacking immediately. Okay. First off, the siding didn't even make sense. Based on the location, Tony number four plane was never supposed to come across it. Either he wasn't where he was supposed to be or the task force location was incorrect. 
This brings up the composition factor. It was unknown. What did 10 ships mean? It could be a carrier task force, or they could simply be auxiliary ships. Nagumo didn't know, and this was unsettling. What if he sends a strike, and the sighting proved to be just destroyers or support ships? This had actually happened to Admiral Takagi a month earlier in the Battle of Coral Sea. Nagumo did not want to... Re yeah, but, and the, uh, I'm not saying that it would happen again, but then the Americans ended up doing, making the same mistake. Obviously, you can't rely on that happening twice. Repeat of that mistake. But there were two additional alarming clues about the sighting. Why was there a force 240 miles northeast of Midway? There would be no reason for a force to be in this location unless it contained a carrier. And if it was a carrier, it would be in a prime position to unleash an attack on the Japanese's flank. Good deductive reasoning. And more importantly, why was it steering into the wind? As it was known, it was procedure for aircraft carriers to steam into the wind when launching their aircraft. Nagumo and his staff apparently saw the validity of these two clues. That makes sense, so it would create more lift. That makes a lot of sense. You don't have a very long runway, and um, if the plane is traveling with the wind, then I I'm assuming that uh, um, it would be much harder to create lift going with the wind than against it where the wind is coming at you and going under the the wings and uh, creating lift, so that makes sense. But in the end, came to the conclusion that it was most likely just a surface force. Why? After Second, all that... the rearmament process wasn't as devastating as many believe. The Val dive bombers weren't affected by this, only the Cates. 34 had been armed with torpedoes, but now only 19 were ready. 15 had been switched to land bombs. So instead of having a full strike complement of 78 planes, he now only had 64 planes properly armed. Although that's only a difference of 15. 64 planes were more than enough to sink any task force encountered. And here's the third factor, time. Nagumo was restricted on time because Tamanaga's force would soon be arriving at about 0815 and they would be low on fuel. Meaning they had to be landed quickly unless they were forced to ditch at sea. This was the worst timing ever for Nagumo. Japanese flight decks were restricted in that they could only do one operation at a time. They could either launch, recover, or spot aircraft. I thought about that. Give me props for that, all right? That's, that's what came to my mind. Only do one operation at a time. They could either launch, recover, or spot aircraft. Thus, Nagumo had to decide, either launch his counter-strike now, or recover the midway strike. The fuel situation was troubling. If he didn't want to lose any more planes through ditching, he needed to finish the recovery by 0845, the latest. Why 0845? Well, let's take a look and work backwards to calculate the time constraints. It's 0745 now. Tomonaga's planes had enough fuel to fly overhead until about 09. I was considering at the beginning splitting this into two videos, but I'm really loving it so far. I'm, I can't believe it's already 25 minutes in and we're just going to do the whole thing. Well, let's take a look and work backwards to calculate the time constraints. It's 0745 now. Tomonaga's planes had enough fuel to fly overhead until about 0915. It would take 20 to 30 minutes to land them. I was just about to say this. Imagine the worst case scenario. You, uh, you're like, you're not sure what to do, and you end up deciding to send out your reserve force um, before letting your... Um, force that your main force that was already out and coming back uh, before letting them land and after the reserve force is out and in the air and on the attack what if what if that took too long and you lost a bunch of planes that were waiting and low on fuel and so that would be like the worst case scenario is getting your reserve planes out but not enough not in enough time not in time to recover your planes that are low on fuel coming back that makes 0845 the threshold. You better finish your launching process by this time, or else start losing aircraft by ditching. This leaves Nagumo with an hour of leeway, and it took about 45 minutes to spot and launch an airstrike. So, if he wants to take this opportunity to launch an attack ditching threshold, you better 30 minutes to land him. That makes 0845 the threshold. You better finish your launching process by this time, or else start losing aircraft by ditching. Right. This leaves Nagumo with an hour of leeway, and it took about 45 minutes to spot and launch an airstrike. 
So if he wants to take this opportunity to launch an attack with what he's got, he can. But he would have to start the process by 0800, the latest. Thus, this is the 15 minute window Nagumo got to make a decision. Jeez, talk about being under pressure, huh? Was an attack feasible? Okay, so my opinion is, again, I don't know all the nuances, but he is asking us to do this. I, I don't have to say that anymore. Obviously, I'm not an expert, but I'm, I'm just like, in my head, just get him out. Get those reserve planes out in the air, attacking or whatever, because in my eyes, if, okay, you, you make the decision to not send them out and keep them below deck and have your planes low on fuel land, well, then that's going to inhibit your ability to get the planes that are ready to go on top of the deck, the ones that are not ready to go below the deck, and then launch them. And so in my eyes, it's like, just just do it. Like, get those planes off and make sure you can get as many planes to land without pilots having to ditch. Oh, yes, it was. The pressure, huh? Wasn't it? Great job decision. on this video. Jeez. Thank you. Who's recommending these? Emperor of Light X7? No, Emperor of Rome. Yeah, they, thank you for uh, recommending these. This is great. Talk about being under pressure, huh? Yeah. Was an attack feasible? Yes, it was. It would be a tight squeeze, but if he began now, by 0800, by 0845, his counter-strike would have taken off and Tomonaga's planes, who would be flying on fumes at this point, would then land. Get the Americans, go. However, scratch that hypothetical, because at 0753, the Kido Butai came under attack by those dive bombers. Theoretically, he could still launch a However, scratch that hypothetical point would then land. However, scratch that hypothetical because at 0753, the Kido Butai came under attack by those dive bombers. Theoretically, he could still launch a strike while under attack, although this was rarely done in combat and, and it was extremely risky. Up. But one thing was for sure, that 45 minute launching process would have definitely stretched out closer to the length of an hour. As a result, the possibility of Tomonaga's air group having to commit a mass ditch would become likely. Disposing of perhaps dozens of aircraft at the start of a battle was unthinkable. So maybe scratch so it. So Gumo had to decide, does he attack this unknown target based in this sketchy, unconfirmed location with some of his planes carrying the wrong ordnance and risk losing additional planes by unnecessary ditching? So I really do have no idea whether this force um, I like this. Um, uh, I know America ends up winning the Battle of Midway. Do we? We do, right? Yeah. But I, I do have no idea if this attacking force end up, ends up being the one that um, deals the decisive blow. But it seems like all everything is pointing to the fact that this does have a carrier. So I'm going to guess that this is going to have a carrier, at least one, and just get them out obviously attacking planes making it shorter uh making it longer to uh get out all of your reserve planes is a huge factor and that might make me depending on how far i am in the stage of launching the reserve aircraft might if i'm early on maybe i'd be like all right halt it keep them below get your anti-aircraft uh guns out shooting and land your plane as low on fuel but if you are more further on in the process of launching your reserves then then that's then I don't know. I'd have to see um, what is, you know, how much time can I get these planes back under ground or back under deck, below deck, and land my ships. Uh, so it would depend. Or he could simply wait until Tamanaga strike had landed. And then after recovery, launch a full balance strike at whatever the what? plane with some of his planes carrying the wrong ordnance and risk losing additional planes by unnecessary ditching or he could simply wait until Tamanaga strike had landed. And then after recovery, launch a full balance strike at whatever this target is with the proper ordnance. Okay, I like that. This was clearly the ultra safe choice that offered no unnecessary risk. But what made Nagumo think he still had time? Well, if we take the reported position at face value, the location meant that even if this force contained a carrier, it wouldn't have been within strike range of an escorted strike. The Americans would have to close the distance and then launch a strike, which meant it wouldn't reach Nagumo's carriers until about 10.15, some two hours from now. Thus, Nagumo would have the time to launch his own counter-strike before he himself was reached. 
So I asked the viewer to press pause and consider the options. Nagumo would have out 10.15, some two hours from now. Thus, Nagumo would have the time to launch his own counter-strike before he himself was reached. So I asked the viewer to press pause and consider the options. My mind is made up. Um, uh, wait, but the, the safety strategy um, of... Uh, I'd say this. I, I am siding with the immediate strike right now. If I can't spend right, I, I'd go with the immediate strike. If I had enough time, absolutely. If there was any question at all that, that me making the immediate strike and sending off the planes would make it very likely that ditching the planes in the air low on fuel would happen, then I'd, I'd scrap it and I'd get all the planes down. But if I do have time for sure, I would send out that initial attack um, of the reserve planes, get the uh, planes low on fuel down, um, get them ready and then send them out after and i can't i can't think about it forever that's my choice that's what i would do i would Honestly, do an immediate with strike. all this information at hand what would you have done immediate strike final answer with the conservative mindset that nagumo had it's not too difficult to imagine which course of action he took second he went for the safest option he would recover his planes first and then launch a powerful, well-balanced strike at the enemy. Nagumo opted for this choice because it promised mass and coordination over anything else. For as much as Nagumo has been criticized, his decision was doctrinal. If any other Japanese commander had been in his place, they would have also made the same decision. So let's continue the saga. Down below, the crews in the hangars worked feverishly to change the cates with land bombs back again to torpedoes. In the midst of all the chaos, the bombs were not stored away safely. Instead, they were laid haphazardly around the hangar. Above in the bridge, Nagumo waited impatiently for further information. I don't know exactly what it takes to make one of those explode, so my anxiety differs based Above on that in information. Above in the bridge, Nagumo waited impatiently for further information. And it wasn't until 0820 that identification... Sorry, are those uh, sandbags? Are those sandbags in order to uh, protect the, um, you know, the coordinating tower here? I forget exactly. Command tower from um, enemy plane fire. I mean, as much as you can. Further information. And it wasn't until not stored away safely. Instead, they were laid haphazardly around the hangar. I'm Above having the fun. Bridge, this is like fun. Impatiently I like for I'm further information. participating. And it wasn't until 0820 that identification of the surface units finally came through. There's a carrier. The enemy is accompanied by what appears to be a carrier. This was dreadful news. Well, you may ask, why not attack now that you have definite confirmation of a carrier? Well, it would still take 45 minutes to get the aircraft out of the hangar. I know it's a 50-50 chance, but my... my... My amazing mind. <laughs> I'm joking. But I just figured why ignore all of the signs that show that, you know, this is weird. Why is this over here? Why are they flying against the wind or coming against the wind? Everything pointed to the that there's a good chance there's a carrier. My guess was right. My educated guess spotted and launched. Oh, that you have definite confirmation of a carrier. Well, it would still take 45 minutes to get the aircraft out of the hangar, spotted, and launched. Meanwhile, Tomonaga's air group would all run out of fuel and crash into the sea. And just there, you lost 97 planes. Also, the strike would have to go unescorted in 45 minutes to get the yeah, aircraft yeah, out of the Yeah, yeah, I'm rewinding. Hangar, Whatever. Spotted. I need to understand. Well, it would still take 45 minutes to get the aircraft out of the hangar, spotted, and launched. Still attack now that you have definite confirmation of a carrier. Well, it would still take 45 minutes to get the aircraft out of the hangar, spotted, and launched. 
Meanwhile, Tomonaga's air group would all run out of fuel and crash into the sea. And just there, you lost 97 planes. Also, the strike would have to go unescorted since all the fighters have been brought up to assist in the air defense of the mobile force during the recent attacks. So the option of launching an unescorted strike, which was bound to receive heavy losses and lose 97 planes through mass ditching, wasn't seriously going to be considered by Nagumo. Basically, it was too late for Nagumo to attack now. He had made his bed, and now he had to lay in it. He would have to wait. Thankfully for him, the last morning attacks died down by 0837. The Kirobutai finally got a break from all the morning attacks and could now begin recovering the aircraft. From 0837 to 0910, Tomonaga's strike force was safely landed. While one can sympathize with the predicament Nagumo was in, there was a decision that was questionable. The Kirobutai changed course to the northeast after recovering the airstrike. Why? This was not necessary. Japanese planes outranged the Americans. There was no reason to close the gap. It would just make it quicker for your opponent to reach you. A wiser decision would have been to head northwest, still allowing you to strike back, but keeping you at the extreme striking range of the Americans. With the last of his aircraft recovered, Nagumo well, was why, now why did he the do Americans. It? With the last of his aircraft recovered, Nagumo was now free to begin spotting his planes on the decks. It was looking good for Nagumo. All he needed now was a 45 minute uninterrupted window and a powerful counter-strike would be dealt to the Americans. However, events would soon foil his high hopes. Damn Americans. Off to the north, enemy aircraft were spotted. Damn, instead of preparing to launch his strike, Nagumo would now be forced into evasive maneuvers and focus on protecting his carriers from the forthcoming assault. These 15 Devastator torpedo bombers were coming in and with no escorts. They would be easy prey for the 30 fighters that were protecting the mobile force. The four carriers turned to port to present their stern to the incoming attackers. What followed next was a stern pursuit which put the Devastators at a disadvantage because of their slow speed. They could barely break 100 knots while carrying their ordnance. The fighters swarmed over them with impunity and they were cut to pieces. Two thirds were intercepted before they were even close to making their run-ins. Only three got close enough to threaten the Soru, but ultimately only one, just one of the 15, was able to launch its torpedo. However, not only did his torpedo miss, but the pilot was shot down himself. I mean, yay, I, I did such a, I'm like, no, but wait, I'm, I'm from the Japanese perspective right now. But the now. pilot was shot down himself. Yeah. The attack had lasted about 15 minutes. Although the Japanese probably didn't know it at the moment, they had just destroyed an entire squadron. And there were no hits to stand for it. There would only be one survivor of the 30 air crew who participated in this heroic attack. Trying so hard not to salute. But as soon as that attack was over, at 0940, another one began, this time from the south. It was at this time that Nagumo had to have realized that his mobile force was in serious trouble. It was imperative that Nagumo get his planes off the deck before being hit himself. All he needed was a 45 minute window to launch an airstrike. But during attacks, he couldn't launch a strike because his flight decks were solely occupied with the replenishment of the combat air patrol fighters. To add to the mess, he was in a dangerous state because at the moment he was at his most vulnerable. His planes were fully fueled, armed, and parked densely within the hangars of his carriers. And more disturbingly, it was clear that these were carrier-based bombers. Obviously, the reported location of the carriers had been wrong this whole time. They had actually been 55 miles closer when they were spotted at 0728. Thus, his mobile force had been within American strike range this entire time. This is a clear example of the fog of war. Just like at Coral Sea, the Japanese commander had made a decision based on the information at hand. Although unbeknownst to him, the information had been incorrect. Sometimes you can just plain out have bad luck. One thing was for sure, Japanese scout planes needed to practice their ship identification and spotting skills. Yeah. Oh well, maybe Nagumo can dodge this attack as well. The 14 torpedo bombers came in, unescorted. 
The two divisions had selected the Kaga as their target, and they were trying to do an anvil attack on the slow carrier. But it would be difficult to do with their slow lumbering planes. Initially, they came in unopposed, but then Zero swarmed over them, and the rightmost division took the brunt of the attack. Two torpedoes were launched, but the Kaga dodged them. With do, I'm wondering, do, do uh, ships stop um, anti-aircraft um, firing their anti-aircraft guns when their own fighters are engaging? Or do they just try and shoot, and if they shoot down their own, they shoot down their own? I'm, I'm assuming additional they would... zeros added to the fray, only three... With additional zeros added to the fray, only three torpedoes from the other division were released. But just as before, the Kaga skillfully avoided them as well. Once again, an attack had been pressed on gallantly by the Americans, but it had been ineffective. Nine of the 14 bombers were shot down, and of these five survivors, one had to ditch on the return trip. Only one zero was lost. Japanese and when that attack finished, an guess edge. what? Edge. Another one began. You have got to be kidding. For the last 50 minutes, these piecemeal attacks, although as ineffective as they were, were delaying the launch of the desperately needed Japanese Counter-Strike. And more frightening, judging this to be the 3rd Torpedo Squadron, there definitely had to be more than one carrier. Actually, there wasn't just one, there were three. Boy, was Nagumo in trouble. Also, the Japanese must have asked themselves at this point, where were the dive bombers? If the Devastators had made it this far, an imminent dive bombing attack was sure to come. But something was different with this forthcoming attack. These 12 torpedo bombers came in with an escort of 6 Wildcats. The Zeros set out to intercept them, but little did they know they were in for a surprise. For the first time in the war, the famous Thatch Weave was used. Named so by its creator, Jimmy Thatch, who was leading the division. The planes would start in a beam defense position. Once a Zero was on the tail of a Wildcat, the two sections would turn towards beam defense position, who was leading the division. The planes would start in a beam defense position. Once a zero was on the tail of a wildcat, the two sections would turn towards each other. This allowed one section to get a head-on attack on the chasing zero. It would either kill or brush off the zeros on your partner's tail. The process could easily be repeated. Interesting. Did they say the thatch? The, wild thatch weave. the planes would okay. the process could e up to this point in the this defensive maneuver stunned the Zero pilots. The process could easily be repeated. This defensive maneuver stunned the Zero pilots. Smart, smart, smart. Up to this point in the war, the Japanese pilots would always come out victorious in dogfights against their opponents. But now, they were the ones getting beaten. Four Zeros were shot down, and only one Wildcat was lost during this interception. Thatch and his fighter squadron alone attracted the attention of over 20 Zeros. Many things have to be acknowledged at this point. First, the escort had done an excellent job. 11 of the 12 Devastators were actually able to push through for their run-ins, and this posed a considerable threat to the carriers. This caused the remaining Zeros, who were looking out for any nearby dive bombers, to descend from their high altitude patrols to shoot down these intruders. Therefore, as we can see, the Northeast Sector became a magnet, sucking in all the fighters on combat air patrol. Disturbingly, this had the effect of leaving the carriers with no overhead protection. What we are seeing here is a dangerous example of target fixation. All eyes were glued on this developing threat that the situational awareness, that is, keeping a lookout for any other threats, was forgotten. This was leaving the Kirobutai in a vulnerable state. The American bombers carried on, but with fresh zeros diving from above, the devastator Shows you how much one uh, pilot can have, or one soldier, one person can have an effect on a battlefield, just coming up with that maneuver. Uh, not just defeating those aircraft, but getting all this attention on you. The American bombers carried on, but with fresh zeros diving from above, the Devastators stood little chance to prevail. The same story played out, and over half were shot down. Eventually, only five would end up launching at the Hiro, but the Japanese carrier successfully avoided them. 
They're so good. The end good. result would be that 10 of the 12 torpedo bombers were lost and one of their four escorts for no hits. This last torpedo attack probably accounted for about seven fighters. The time was 1020. The torpedo attack was halfway through and as expected, not one had struck home. It was a testament to the prowess of the Japanese pilots. The Kido Butai had been in combat for the last three hours and had avoided all the bombs and torpedoes thrown at it with its evasive maneuvers and its skilled fighters. Nagumo had been quite lucky actually. His mobile force with no radar had shot down 53 aircraft at this point. I want to shake the hands of those pilot of those captains, whoever's steering those uh, Japanese aircraft carriers. Good on you. Lucky well actually. Done. His mobile force with no radar had shot down 53 aircraft at this point and had lost only 11 fighters itself and there wasn't even a scratch on his ships. But it was precisely at this moment when all the fighters were down below fighting off this latest assault in the northeast sector that a new threat emerged high above. 50 dive bombers were approaching overhead, undetected and unopposed, and coming from two different directions. Yeah. Nagumo's luck I, had fine. I mean, no, I'm, I'm in the Japanese point of view. 50 dive bombers were approaching overhead, uh. undetected and unopposed, and coming from two different directions. Nagumo's luck had finally run out. The Kido Butai had never been faced with defeat before. In the previous six months, they had ruled the seas. They had sunk five capital ships, a light carrier, two cruisers, and half a dozen destroyers. But now, their unbroken string of victories would come to an end. These dive bombers weren't rookies like the Midway Base Bombers. These were the A-Team of the Pacific Fleet. And with no opposition, the result would be deadly. From the south came two squadrons, and they all teamed up on one carrier, the enormous Kaga. 30 dive bombers began their steep dives from 19,000 feet. The Kaga was practically taken by surprise and she received four hits. One of which landed on the bridge killing the captain and his staff. The planes being fully fueled and armed inside the hangar ignited, causing a chain of secondary explosions. She quickly became an inferno. And all of those scattered around haphazardly, uh, you know, when they were switching. The ammunition obviously wouldn't help the explosion. Causing a chain of secondary explosions. She quickly became an inferno. The Soru was attacked by 13 dive bombers. Three bombs were placed evenly along the center of her flight deck. All her hangars were hit, and just like the Kaga, the bombs set off a chain of explosions inside the ship. Fires immediately engulfed the carrier. It looked as if the Akagi might get off scot-free. However, when the Kaga was being pummeled, Three dive bombers peeled off at the last moment and went for her. With pure skill, a bomb was dropped in its upper hangar. It didn't seem serious at first. A carrier this big could have certainly survived this single hit. But just like her sister ships, the planes and bombs inside her hangars began to detonate. Thereafter, fire spread uncontrollably, and the Akagi, the flagship of the Kido Butai, was doomed. In less than five minutes, history had changed. The powerful Kido Butai had been wrecked. Only one had been able to escape destruction, the Hiro. The outcome of the battle now rested upon the shoulders of the Hiro and her elite pilots. Wow, that was an experience. Um, that was awesome. I haven't felt like that uh, since the Napoleonic, like the Marshalls and the Napoleonic Wars series in Epic History TV. Emperor of Rome, good on you. Great video. Be back with another one soon, guys, for sure. There are multiple parts to this. Clearly, I will be reacting to those and more. See you guys next time.